Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Atari Video Computer Stream here on twitch.tv slash mockduck, mockduck plays games. I stream Atari just about every Sunday night at 9 o'clock Eastern right here on this channel. I am a non-profit affiliate. I am an affiliate on Twitch because I want to play around with the fun stuff, but I also want to raise a little money for charity. So, any bits that come in? Any subscription revenue, any Amazon affiliate revenue goes to the Maple Farm Sanctuary. They're a sanctuary for abused, abandoned, neglected farm animals not too far from where I live and in Menden, Massachusetts. If you happen to tune in to last Wednesday's show, you'll know that we were able to finally make our first donation to the Maple Farm Sanctuary. We were able to donate $100.53. Thanks all your donations. So, I really do appreciate it. Today we are going to have a grab bag of different Atari-related things. We're going to look at the latest pickups that I've been able to get. We're going to talk a little bit about the modern, finally broach, and discuss with you the Atari VCS. That's supposedly coming in about a year. They'll be starting to take money. The new Atari is towards the end of the month. We're also going to do a deep dive on the Flashback Portable. Maybe you've seen it at Target, Walmart, and what have you. I'll give you a rundown as just what I think about this thing, and on top of that, I'll show you a really cool hack that'll let you get every single, just about, Atari game onto this device. So, looks like we have a pretty cool show here. Why don't we start with a little bit about uh, some of the new pickups that I've done here today, or in the, since the last time we did a show. I'm going to uh, switch cameras here. Here we go. The uh, And I'll be playing some of these games later tonight to kind of show off what it is that we have here. But the first one I was able to get is a SpectraVision cart. SpectraVision is also known as Spectra Video. As a matter of fact, if you find Spectra Video on the label rather than SpectraVision, it tends to be worth just a little bit more. They changed their name after they stopped just doing video and started branding out into video games. So they changed their name to Spectra Vision. But if you have any old Spectra video carts, like I say, they're actually worth a little bit extra. Have a nice label on them. Nice good carts. And this is the Challenge of Nexar, which is a very, very classic retro video game name for it. Not the greatest game in the world. As a matter of fact, when I popped it into my Atari, I couldn't figure out how to play it. But we're going to deep dive into this thing tonight and figure it out. The next thing I was able to pick up uh, from the last time we spoke is one of the other uh, CCW children's carts, Alpha Beam with Ernie. This is, of course, Sesame Street branded. All these Sesame Street branded carts tend to have Actiplac. That's not actually dirt. That's uh, glue from the label that just kind of has deteriorated the label over the decades. What's interesting about all of these children's carts, and I, I'm only missing a couple at this point, and then I'm going to have all of them. I'm missing Oscar's Trash Race and Big Bird's Egg Catch. But I have now Alpha Beam with Ernie, and uh, they're mostly Sesame Street games, but there are also some Disney games, Peanuts games, and Muppets games. The Muppets in Space that I showed off uh, oh, several months ago comes from that same group, and you know that they're a kid's game because they have a checkered label. You can't really see it on here unless you see it in person. It's kind of faded over time, but there's actually a checker pattern on this yellow. And they Atari branded that to basically show that, yes, this is a kid's game. And this, too, uses what's called the Atari Kids Controller. You can play it with a regular keyboard controller, which you might have if you have Star Raiders or something like that. There's really a numpad, number pad of uh, 1 through 10 like an old telephone, that you would plug in to the joystick port, and it would give you an option to play sort of button-type games. And most of these educational games would use it for math, of course, for letters, and just for simple things like that. The kids' controllers are basically a kidified version of the keyboard controller. So thankfully, they're compatible with the keyboard controller, because keyboard controllers are easy to find, kids' controllers are much less so. Not too surprisingly, you know, any time that you had a, a peripheral specifically made toward children, it tended to get broken. 
Imagine that, right? Little kids playing with Atari games would smash it. They just didn't last that long. You can still find them, but they're about 30 bucks a piece uh, on eBay. And that's a little beyond what I've wanted to pay. And I've yet to find one in the, mon in the wild. But they're basically bigger versions of the keyboard controllers, big, thick blue plastic. And they would have these overlays that would come with every game. Unfortunately, I don't have any of the overlays. I don't have any of the box copies of these either. But they would have an overlay almost like the Intellivision did where you would fit it into the kids' controller, and it would tell you what buttons to press, basically. It would be like, this button moves Big Bird right. This one is the left arrow. You know, extra stuff for kids. So anyway, Alpha Beam with Ernie, certainly not much of an advanced game. I mean, it is about what you'd expect, right? Match, matching letters and that sort of thing. But a pretty interesting find, nonetheless. And I got this for just a couple of bucks. It was kind of nice. I'm almost, like I said, I'm two carts away from having a complete children's cart collection. Uh, the third card I wanted to show off here today is a 20th century box game in actually a very cool looking label. I don't know if you can really see it. You can tell it's a little bit post-crawl in Star Wars called Crypts of Chaos. Crypts of Chaos is one that we will actually show here in a little bit. Unfortunately, I got this really cheap because someone had written... Crypts of Chaos and pen at some point on the label. You could tell, <laughs> they couldn't tell what card it was because it didn't have a label on the front. That's actually fairly common for 20th century Fox games, but they wouldn't have the name of the game on the uh, front here. But because it, had, it was a little bit deteriorated, I got this one also for just a couple of dollars. But the label itself, I think, is in pretty good shape overall, and so I didn't mind paying it. And I'll be um, playing this one later on. This is a really cool kind of fantasy action game for the Atari. And then finally, the fourth pickup I have here today is one of the latest games I have for the Atari. This one goes all the way to 1988, 11 years after the Atari VCS debuted in 1977. This is Sprint Master. You can generally tell that you have a later version Atari card let's say post-1986, 87, because it's going to have this red outline on it. A lot of the greatest hits ones that they released around that time and uh, red label ones like this tended to be later cards. This one, of course, 1988, Sprint Master for the Atari 2600. Now, why was Atari releasing games all the way in 1988? You'll recall, of course, that the a video game crash, as it were, happened in 1984. Well, there's one word as to why Atari would release these carts. Well, two, actually. But let's say one word why Atari would release these carts in 1988. And that is the Nintendo. You may recall that the Nintendo Entertainment System debuted in Japan, I believe, and as the Famicom in 1985-86, and debuted in the United States in late 1987. However, it really wasn't until 1988 that the Nintendo was widely available in the United States and was huge. Mario, of course, was huge. And so, all of a sudden, video games were back. Home video game consoles were back, and Atari was like, well, we've still got some games we can release here. So, for those who can't get Nintendo, or don't want a Nintendo, or whose parents are like, oh, don't you already have a video game console? I thought we have an Atari. They released games all the way clear through until 1991 was the last actual Atari video game released, and that one was Secret Agent, I believe. I think that's right. I'll double check that at some point as I do a special episode on late period Atari games. But there's one other reason why this was released for the 2600 as well. Thankfully, this one came, uh, this was an eBay purchase. I think I got it for about 10 bucks, And this one came with a manual for Sprint Master. Now, it's a pretty basic game and not really all that great a game. And you could tell, unlike the early era Atari games, which would have these lovely, thick manuals full of text and pictures and what have you, this one's pretty basic. But you'll see, in terms of getting started, with your Atari 2600 or 7800 setup, insert the Sprint Master cartridge into the console. So when Nintendo hit the big time, as it were, and all of a sudden everyone was buying Nintendo products, 
Atari had wanted, even before the Nintendo came out, to release the 7800. However, various market forces and ability to get it into stores, manufacturing delays, and other things actually put the 7800's release a little bit after the NES. Uh, there are three basic Atari classic consoles, not including their computers. The 2600, the 5200, and the 7800. The 5200 came out in 84, 85, and the 7800 came out, uh, I can't remember exactly, about 87-ish as well. So it was backwards compatible. Unlike the 5200, it was straight up backwards compatible. So you could buy the advanced version of the games for the 7800 with a little bit higher graphics. Still not really NES quality, but pretty darn close to it. But all your old Atari 2600 cards came out as well. So they'd release a game like Sprint Master so that people with a 7800, there's like, hey, you can play this on your new console. It'll look great, even though it's the same graphics as the 2600. But if you had a 2600, you could still put that in as well. So th something like this would have been released, I'm assume, I would presume, I don't know this game in particular, but a lot of the games that got released around this time were budget titles. You could pay, you know, full price for the 7800 version or less for the 2600 version. They were kind of hoping to double dip and keep the keep the thing going here. It's like, hey, people want video games. Nintendo's hot. We have a brand new console. It plays all your old 2600 games, unlike the Nintendo, which of course doesn't. And uh, so if you still want to, we have brand new games for your console. And they're modern graphics, even though they're not really. So anyway, that, I thought that was cool, though, because the number of late-period Atari games I have is actually fairly low. But I do have a few of them, and as you might imagine, a 7800, while not a complete failure, wasn't really a big commercial success either. And a lot of people at this point weren't buying a lot of cartridges for their 2600, which makes these kind of games typically a little bit rarer. You know, you'll recall for rarity... The most popular games are often not rare. The ones that sold the least or didn't make it to shelves at all, those are the really rare ones. So because the later period Atari games tended to be less popular, with a few exceptions like Ghostbusters, for example, um, they tend to actually be a little bit rarer and therefore a little bit more expensive. Like I say, I got this with the manual for about 10 bucks, and as you can see, this one is in really good shape. Just uh, almost zero damage to that label. And uh, zero damage to the sides. So this one's actually in really nice shape and a, a pretty good find for me. So, so we're actually going to dig into some of these games. Actually, why don't we get started with that now? That's about as good a time as any to, to play some of these things. And then we'll go into some of the other stuff. So I'm going to boot up Stella. And we will check these games out. All right, why don't we start off, let's just go alphabetically here. So we will do Alpha Beam with Ernie. Atari, 1983. Not really seeing. I'm not quite sure, unfortunately. I don't know what the keyboard numbers are. Arrows. <laughs> uh, that's the problem with playing Stella. All right, let's see. Uh, input settings. Supports. Okay, it should just be the number keys. All right, so let's see. Fortunately, doesn't seem to want to work for me. I may not be able to get Alpha Beam with Ernie totally going here. I'm also not hearing any audio, so let me see if I can't fix that as well. Make sure that I don't have it set completely down on the mixing board. Okay, I don't. It's there. Rah! Oh, 
Oh, I did something. Ah, what did I do? Hmm. I glitched it out. Alright. Let me try it one more time, see if I can get the options here going. Uh, let's see. Config paths, audio settings, video settings, game properties, controller, keyboard, mouse access. Alright, we'll give this one more shot, see if we can't get this thing working. And if not, then we will play something else. Okay. Ah, okay, cool. So there we go, matching up the letters. For those who want to know, this is 123QWEASD is the proper number combination to get these things working. But you have to have the numpad off. And Ernie goes off. <laughs> Nice. Now we are going with the letter B. Like I say, these are kids' games, right? So they're pretty pretty basic stuff. Nothing too too fancy there. I'm gonna turn down the volume a bit. But you know, it helps it helps kids learn the alphabet. Use the number pads and all that sort of thing. Not exactly the worst kids game in the world. I, there's a couple of really good ones. As a matter of fact, one of my favorites, uh, Underrated, is on there. And that is Snoopy vs. the Red Baron. It's a kid's game. Released as part of the kid's series. And that one's actually quite fun. Additionally, I don't hate The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Disney. That's a pretty good one as well. Yeah, unfortunately on Stella, the volume controls are a little tough to maneuver. But if I use the Windows volume mixer, that works out probably the best. Deathman had an 800XL, then a 130XE Atari, and played cards on the 800XL. Yeah, you know, that's actually a pretty interesting point, that a lot of the personal computers that Atari released also had cartridge slots. Some of which were compatible with the old 2600, some of which were not. But I know um, the XC, I believe, in particular, was. I'm pretty sure that's the case because I, I recall a friend of mine actually had had one of those. All right, so that's Alpha Beam with Ernie. We really don't need to go into that one too much because there's, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Crips of Chaos. Now this one, I actually am going to look up the instructions on uh, before I get an opportunity. Atari Crips of Chaos. I'm going to see if I can't figure out the instructions of this thing. HTML manual. Okay. Descend as far into the crypts as possible, stealing every treasure, killing every monster. They're mazes. You will see two small squares, or cursors, and a row of symbols at the bottom. The top cursor represents you and your weapon. The lower cursor represents which, which action is selected. The row of symbols represent your action options. Your hit count is shown in the upper left corner. Hits represent your hit points. Okay, so joystick forward to walk down the corridor. When you reach an intersection, tilt the joystick all the way to the left or right or turn. When a monster appears on the screen, you cannot move forward. You must take action. Pull the joystick toward me and to the left or right to select an action button. The cursor is over the action you want. Push the joystick straight forward to lock that action in. And then but use the button to activate it. Okay. 
So not too bad. So. Good, I'm trying to figure out the which buttons actually work here. And I'm not having much luck, unfortunately, getting the keyboard working. Maybe I should hook up a controller. Oh, okay, okay, here we go. So if I pull down and left, I will select which option, move forward to do it. And there we go, there's the button to attack. Okay. So now I'm moving forward through the uh, screens here. You know, I'm going to, um, ah, it's like a ghost. I'm going to have to lower the volume again. All right. So it's interesting um, when you look at first-person perspective in Atari games. I'm actually going to do a segment on that. A lot of people think that this began with, um, you know, Doom, that sort of thing. But it was really obviously wizardry, things like that, for the PC that really brought about the first-person perspective. And interestingly, there's a number of Atari games that did it as well. All right. This is one of them, but there's one that's even closer that's probably worth mentioning. Uh-oh. Oh, I guess I died. Anyway, that's Crypts of Chaos. Pretty rudimentary game, not exactly the easiest game to control, but not the worst game in the world if you want to uh, have the patience to really fiddle around with it and figure out how to play it. Alright, next one up is going to be... I don't know if they have... Here we go. Challenge of Nexar. Challenge of Nexgar, Nexar is an interesting one in that it's really a, a shooter. Pretty straightforward, but not very easy either. So you lose points every time one of these guys gets to the end of the screen. And every time one of them, these things hits you. Which, as, as you can see, is fairly easy to do. And that was one game of Challenge and XR. It is a, indeed a challenge. get a little better at it with practice, but even so, this game is not easy. It's quite the trippy game, though. Yeah, I did a little better than last time. But I, as you can see, that's pretty much the game. You will go through different waves of things. You know, if you can survive all the way through to the end of all of that time, then you will uh, move on to the next phase where some different enemies come out and things like that. Not a terrible game, and actually a pretty action-packed game if you're into that kind of thing. So, so there you go. Challenge of Nexar, and then finally we're going to show Sprint Master. Uh, this one is a fairly standard racing game, all said and done, but it's not the worst uh, game either. It has two players, and you can either bounce or you can crash.
So you accelerate the space, and then you use the arrow keys to turn. Left and right, relative. As you can see, it's not nearly as easy. This also does not use the driving paddles, which is kind of a bummer. But, you know, at the time 88 came about, they were just like driving paddles for old hat, and they just weren't very commercially successful. So that's really all there is to it. But you do have different uh, kind of laps and versions and that you can do. This is one of those games that is challenging until you get the hang of it, in which case you can really just kind of play forever. However, it is, like I say, a two-player competitive game as well, so it could be worse. And you may wonder why they went with a top-down perspective, but a lot of the... Yay! A lot of the arcade games at the time were really big. Sprint was uh, really was uh, one with the steering wheel, and it was a really popular game as well. So anyway, uh, those are the four new pickups I got here. We may play a little bit more of that later. In particular, Challenge of Nexar is one that I, I have been trying to, to figure out how to make all work. But All right, let us move on, though, to our next topic of the night. And that is going to be the controversy and my opinions on the Atari VCS. So, this past fall, Atari, which is at this point really just an investment consortium out of France, came out with what they said was going to be the new Atari, a brand new game console that would hook up to your television set with the Atari branding logo and logo. And man, did they nail the look. Uh, people, if you've been on my Facebook feed at all, you'll know that I got a lot of people are like, hey, check this thing out. Of course, I did see it already. But that look at that console, huh? So the Atari VCS is a very nice looking real wood console that is theoretically going to launch in spring 2019. Originally, they had planned to do an Indiegogo fundraiser around the holidays, but literally hours before they started taking people's money for it, they pulled the plug on the thing and said, uh, we're just not ready yet. Stay tuned. We'll have more info at a later date. It wasn't until April here that they announced that they will be taking pre-orders at the end of May. So, in just a couple of weeks here, you too can give Atari money on Indiegogo for a console that may get released. I'm giving them money anyway. You know I'm giving them money anyway. But the controversy is really this. Who is Atari nowadays? Do they have the capability of releasing a console? What is the even purpose of the console? And why does it cost so much? So, to start off with, Atari is not a tech companies so much anymore as they are a brand. You'll find Atari shirts at Walmart and Target. Uh, they do licensing of games for third-party companies like At Games and Hamster and other emulated emulator groups to release classic Atari collections on you know, the PlayStation, the Xbox, the PC, things like that. They have, on their own, attempted over the years multiple times to kickstart their own games. They have the Atari Vault, which is a you know, pretty good game. Um, and that's actually by Code Mystics, uh, which is the developer of that. They're another third party that does a lot of Atari type stuff. But the Atari brand themselves doesn't really do a whole lot of modern video gaming. They have a railroad tycoon, but again, they shipped that out to another development company to do. And they want to get back into the game. They're a very small company at this point, based in France. They, I don't know their exact makeup, but it's believed that there may be a dozen or less people actually working for Atari nowadays. So, given all that, the fact that they don't really make games anymore, they haven't been in the hardware business for decades, not since the Atari Jaguar, in, which went defunct in the mid-90s, 
there's a lot of questions about can they actually pull this off. There's also a lot of kind of just haters on the internet who like to criticize things, you know. So not surprisingly, when the console first debuted, people all pretty much agreed that thing looks rad. It has a modern VCS 2600 styling, but also has a modern, cool look to it. So they definitely nailed the look. Everyone's real happy with that. It's just mostly a matter of, should I really be giving this modern version of Atari up to $300 on a console that we don't even know is actually going to come out? Particularly when they pulled the funding campaign just at the last minute in December, people were like, Atari is dead. The Atari box, it was at the time it was called the Atari box, um, is dead. I mean, it ain't never coming out. So, you know, I kind of just put my hands up and said, well, we'll see what happens. So, during this year's GDC, which was the Game Developers Conference in Austin, Texas, I believe it was March, Atari was there. They weren't formally at GDC. They didn't have a booth on the exhibit hall floor, but they had a hotel room nearby. And members of the press who attended GDC for other game-related press purposes were invited to take a look at the VCS in person, your first chance to actually see this console. When members of the press got there, they realized that there was nothing to actually play. The console lit up, but was not connected to a television. There were no games to actually play with it. Basically what Atari had done is put some LED lights in a plastic box and made their head of Atari visible and available for interviews. At that time as well, they released a PDF that was really just kind of a, here's everything that we, you need to know about the flashback. And let me actually see, looks like I accidentally erased that, but I can get that back. The VCS FAC at the time, they renamed it from the Atari box to the Atari VCS, Video Computer System. It's the official name of Atari's new modern hardware platform. It is a new connected device for modern audiences that will also please long-standing fans. The Atari VCS name and hardware design is inspired by the original Atari VCS, let you know. The logo is inspired by their classic design as well. All they really say on the hardware is, it's hardware, software, and peripherals are ongoing. They're working with partners to finalize what they're going to actually be able to play on it. At this point, they at, remember in GDC, they said we'll have a pre-order date, end of April 2018. So here's what we do know about the Atari VCS. This was actually from the Game Developers Conference and has remained pretty consistent throughout, up to and including their most recent announcement, which I'll get to in just, just a minute or two here. Performance will be comparable to a higher-end PC laptop. It'll do 4K, HDR, 60 frames a second, and have an AMD x86 processor. It'll have both onboard storage and expandable storage, It'll have both Wi-Fi, dual-band Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth 5.0, and it'll run on USB 3.0. So it's also going to be on a proprietary Linux OS. They say that allows for flexible content so that you can play other games that you have for Linux uh, on this thing connected to your television. Atari is going to be publishing and delivering the games. It is not an open source platform, unlike, say, the Ouya, which if you really want to delve deep into not very successful <laughs> uh, console startups, the Ouya was an attempt to have a console that was an open source thing. And it, it launched after a pretty successful Kickstarter and then pretty quickly kind of died. Um, it just didn't really have enough commercial success to really be able to, to stay concurrent. Although I've heard people still actually have them and have modded them to do some pretty cool things. So it's not entirely terrible. They do say the VCS will allow people to use a quote, wide assortment of applications and content available to Linux users. They anticipate Steam and other storefronts will work on the VCS. 
they are also saying that it'll have television. It'll have live streaming. So one would assume Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, also perhaps Twitch uh, compatibility, although that isn't entirely known at this point. So after GDC, there was another round of kind of speculation on the part of people. Is this a real thing? Is it not? Well, it didn't actually play anything. So what are they actually showing other than a pl the same plastic box that we saw the picture of earlier with some LED lights in it? And so in April here, they have announced um, that they will be taking pre-orders towards the end of May. It was the very last day of April that they finally announced their thing. And they did show some cool pictures here as well. It's going to have two controllers, as you can see in this picture. One which is a kind of redesigned retro Atari joystick. Again, design-wise, looks kind of awesome. Uh, the other thing that you can't really see in this picture, but that circle, that orange circle in that pic, is lights. When you push left, it lights up to the left. When you push the joystick right, it lights up to the right. As you can see, it's wireless rather than wired, which is cool. And it's also allegedly going to ship with a, what, I guess, to be nice, would say, a modern peripheral style controller, not unlike the Xbox's controller. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I kind of wonder why they didn't get sued by Xbox, because holy moly does that thing look like an Xbox controller. Uh... Nonetheless, it is allegedly not an Xbox controller and uh, will allow you to play games that clearly you need more than one button for. So that will allow you to play, theoretically, your Steam games and things like that that are released on Linux, in addition to the more advanced games that, theoretically, Atari uh, will be releasing for the VCS. So overall, you know, once again, they've got killer-looking hardware. If, if it actually ends up shipping, if it ends up shipping, and it looks like that, that's going to be pretty rad, as far as I'm concerned. I really do like that joystick. They did show off a video of someone playing Centipede, although, again, it's not entirely clear that it's a legit picture. Um, it kind of looks like someone may have actually put the joystick in the frame with the VCS on the table. And then underneath the table, <laughs> there's actually like an emulator playing Centipede. You know, if you want to dig deep into this thing, there's a several hundred page thread on Atari Age forums that'll kind of go into this sort of thing. But none of that sort of stuff has been, for those who are particularly critical of the modern Atari, or this Atari box slash VCS thing to begin with, none of that has really allayed their concerns. If anything, it has exacerbated them. For those who have been following along after the PlayStation and Xbox and Nintendo, there are some also RANs. There was the Ouya, the Steam Box. Remember, the Steam Box was a thing that was going to plug into your television set, run Linux, and be able to play everything from your Steam sales. Steam hasn't officially killed, Valve hasn't officially killed the Steam Box, but they have officially stopped selling it from their own store. So the, while theoretically a third-party manufacturer can still get a license and uh, sell a Steam box, they're just, they just have not been a commercial success and uh, have not sold very much. So all indications are, uh, in interviews, the head of the modern Atari has said it'll basically be a mid-tier PC that'll hook up to your television with awesome retro styling that'll run Linux and uh, modern TV. It'll play up to 4K. Probably not games. They're probably talking 4K video, though. They have not specified that. But one would assume that even if, say, like the PlayStation 4 Pro doesn't do true 4K video gaming, it tends to be upscaled. One's going to assume the Atari VCS isn't going to do true 4K gaming. It'll probably do 4K video, though, which is perfectly cool. Uh, for Netflix and Hulu and YouTube and things like that that support it. So, what's the current status? 
Atari has released that through Indiegogo, they will be taking pre-orders towards the end of May. Prices for people who want to get in on the ground floor early will be $200, $199.99. But there's a couple gotchas there. The $200 version at a discount, they have said, is not the wood grain version, but rather a version similar to this, but with a black faceplate, kind of like their classic Vader style, which uh, I guess you can't really see the side here, but this is the Vader version of it with the thing on the side. Unlike in this picture as well, the $200 version will not come with a controller. Now, for many people, that'll be perfectly fine. Uh, it is USB 3.0 compatible, so any general Linux compatible joysticks should theoretically be able to just get plugged into it or use Bluetooth and connect to it and be able to play games just fine. But if you're going to buy this Atari box, you probably want an Atari controller as well. They have not announced what the upper tier packages are going to be, but given the history of what they've said so far, it is likely that there will be a $199 price point, a $249 price point, and a $299 price point. The $299 price point will almost certainly be the wood grain version with some allegedly real wood front and the joysticks that come with it. So $300 bucks to get in on this. I'm an Atari nerd. You know this. I do every Sunday night, the Atari Video Computer Stream. So hell yeah, I'm buying one for 300 bucks. That said, it is a tough sell for those who aren't quite as dedicated as me to this kind of thing. You don't need it. If you want to get a little mini PC that you can hook up to your TV, you can buy a Steam box. You can buy uh, basically a Roku and one of a whole bunch of other things, probably for less than $300, and get the same results. If you want to buy a video game console, the PlayStation 4 is currently $249. The PlayStation 4 Pro can go up to $400, but even so, you can find it on sale for about $300. Bucks. The Xbox One is $300 or less. Uh, the Nintendo Wii or not we, but um, the Nintendo Switch is 300 bucks. So, if you are going to be buying a console, would you recommend to somebody that they purchase the Atari VCS, which is allegedly coming out in spring 2019 for 300 Or would you recommend a PlayStation 4? <laughs> so... <laughs> If you want retro gaming, I think this thing looks rad. I am really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really fun. But I have to admit, you know, it's a pretty tough sell to your average customer to think they're going to spend $300 on this thing. So what does that mean? Will they get enough people to actually be able to launch this thing in a way that's going to be successful? That remains to be seen. They're going to kick off their Indiegogo at the end of May. What if they don't get much money? You know, if I give them three hundred dollars, am I guaranteed to get one of these things in spring twenty nineteen? What if there aren't enough people to make manufacturing a success? Can they make it like basically a custom built PC on an on demand basis for three hundred bucks? And here's the other catch as well. Unlike Kickstarter where people set a goal and then others can choose to donate to that goal and if it hits the goal then it's funded indiegogo does not have a goal so which is why atari is doing this so if they make a thousand bucks they get to keep the thousand dollars if they make thirty thousand dollars they get to keep the 30000 If, as I suspect they're hoping, they make, you know, 300000 then they probably have enough to actually make this thing happen and get at least something shipped to Blackers in about a year. But there is definitely a concern about, well, what happens if 
I give them my $300 and they're not able to make this thing work. Am I out the money? The answer is sadly, yes. There is no guarantee that you're going to get your money back. Atari does not owe you your money back. Specifically when you donate to Indiegogo, it says you are giving this money regardless of the success or failure of the project, regardless of how many people choose to fund this thing. So, frankly, it's risky. Again, someone like myself, I love Atari. I've gotten so many years of, a, of great stuff out of Atari, and I want one of these things, and I don't mind if they make one console and they make it for me, I'll be perfectly happy. As a matter of fact, that would be awesome, because I bet in 20 years it would be worth a ton of money. But, realistically, given that, given the price point, given the uncertainty about what's going to get published for it, given uncertainty about the specs, given the fact it's going to be a whole other year before this thing even comes out, can you really recommend to your everyday gamer that they should spend $300, 200 to $300, on an Atari VCS? The Atari community largely says, uh-uh. If you look at, there's like a 300-page thread in uh, the Atari Age forums, which is almost entirely negative. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the few voices of positivity in that thread, because I think it's going to be awesome. But even I have to admit, this thing is... It's not sketchy. I mean, I think that they, they're in it with honest intent. I do think they want to release an awesome modern console that plays retro Atari games in addition to new things. And I know that they're a small team, so they can't just make it happen with their reserves of money. So, but it's certainly not a safe way to spend $300. Odds that you're not going to get anything for it are unfortunately a little high. But we'll see, right? Maybe there, maybe the Atari name and the coolness, the, the general cool factor of this thing is enough that it's going to be just fine, right? So, we shall see. Nonetheless, they definitely, at the very least, I do want to say, have come up with just an amazing-looking modern-day retro console. It's a bummer it doesn't play actual Atari carts, but I can understand why they wouldn't go that route. Um, they don't make any money on these old cartridges anymore. The only people who make money at this point are the resellers, if, if even that. And as we saw with a recent SNES release of Street... Uh, no, Mega Man... Five or two and three, I can't remember. There was a recent 8 bit do release of an SNES cartridge, and they were legally required to say if you put this thing in your SNES, it could start on fire. Now, it's not really going to start on fire. You don't really have to worry about that. But they had to say that because you are looking at old cartridges, old technology, and so legally they kind of have to, they get into a gray area of having modern compatibility for very old cartridges. Rather than have to deal with that, it makes sense to just not have it, let you buy them, they make money, etc. It is supposed to come with the Atari Vault installed. That's how they're handling, uh, does it come with any classic Atari games? Yes. It comes with all the games that are currently available on the Steam version of Atari Vault, which is like a hundred and some games. It is a pretty good set up and you could buy it on steam right now for like eight to ten dollars <laughs> so it's cool it's nice that it comes with these games um but again you know the value add there isn't particularly high so so i know i'm sounding awful negative on the vcs and i i actually am very excited about this i think it looks great if they're able to deliver let's say a mid-tier pc you know, for $300, that'll allow me to easily stream Atari games directly from the console through my television set, two-player even, or maybe even online multiplayer, that would be perfect. That's all I want from this thing, is the ability to, let's just say, uh, go online, play combat and stuff with people um, across the world, and be able to live stream it straight from that console. Additionally, I personally am excited about some of the 
cord cutter style TV things in it. I have Netflix on my PlayStation. I've got Hulu and Pluto and Tubi and all these other really cool ones. But hey, another source to hook that thing up into my television, I'm down for that as well. Particularly if it offers 4K, which, which might be a real nice selling point for that thing as well. So I think overall it's going to be very cool. What are the odds that by spring 2019 I actually have something in the mail that I paid $300 for that actually works and is still cool? Well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> but uh, but nonetheless, they are getting my money. I can tell you that much. I'm going to be uh, putting it down. I'll probably be... I would not be surprised if I was among the first dozen people to give them money for this thing. I probably... There's even a chance I might be number one. Because I will be sitting there with my credit card ready to give them money as soon as they open up that Indiegogo. But, uh, but realistically, I think my word for those would be caution. If that's a lot of money to you, if you're not, you know, a big Atari fan, I, I really don't know if I can suggest that you spend the money on this thing. Ultimately, if it is a success, it'll come out. And you can buy one when you can actually get one in the mail, too. So, hey, that's pretty cool. But, you know, the VCS has been a hot topic in the Atari community for months now. And it's really cool that it's coming out. I wish Atari the best of luck. I will say this as well. I am debiased. I own Atari stock. Granted, I might have owned Atari stock partially because, hey, I'm an Atari nerd, so why the heck shouldn't I own Atari stock? And partially I own Atari stock because someone on the Atari Age forums who was being a real jerk to me was just like, blah, 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 why don't you just waste your money and buy Atari stock? And I was like, well, fine, I will then. So I am the proud owner of 40 shares of Atari stock. T-A-R-I-F is the uh, NASDAQ symbol for Atari. So, yep, I own 40 shares of Atari stock that I purchased at a high of 82 cents a share and is currently worth, well, actually, I don't know what it's worth. Let me, let me see if I can call that up. Not 82 cents, I'll tell you that much. So Atari is basically a penny stock at this point. Um, they don't make a lot of money. Uh, they've been delisted after they went bankrupt in 2013. Yeah, that's the other piece of this puzzle. Atari went bankrupt in 2013. So the people that own this at this point really are just a, a French holding company. But they're a French holding company made of people who like Atari games. And, and they do, I do sense passion for the brand. So, okay. I now own 40 shares of Atari stock that I bought at 82 cents. That is now 69 cents a share. So I spent like $32 on this, and I've lost a couple dollars. But hey, if the Atari VCS takes off and is a huge success, I may be, that $32 investment may be worth $40, $45. <laughs> But I think it's kind of rad. I've been enjoying, actually, keeping an eye on Atari stock and, and uh, can say I'm an official uh, owner of Atari stock there. So that's pretty rad. But <laughs> all right. So let us move into my uh, third subject of the evening. Actually, you know what? Let me take a little break um, and play another game here just to give my voice a little break and give us something fun. I'm going to play one of my favorite Atari games. This is Jungle Hunt, you know, based on the arcade classic. And I actually really enjoy this game. I think it's one of the better Atari games out there. Jungle Hunt is a particularly interesting game for its time, 
in part because it has multiple levels to it. There were other games that had this kind of thing going on, like Tron and that. But Jungle Hunt was a particularly interesting one. I don't know. Dang it. I just got eaten by an alligator. Okay, normally you can knife them, but it's kind of difficult to do on this emulated version, so I'm just going to uh, dodge them instead. What is it with me and alligators? I know, right? Yeah, I recently died in a pen and paper stream trying to kill alligators. Ah, oh, no! Dang it. I am better at this game, but normally, like I say, this is an, kind of a little bit of a weird emulated version of it. Um, I could actually get through this pretty well on an actual Atari console with a joystick. There we go. Almost. Atari definitely did have a thing for alligators. You know, one of the things, it's hard to give it, you know, at the time, but if you look at it, there's all multiple, um, fi oops, multiple fields going on. Um, oh, dang it. Okay, the controls on this thing are kind of bad. Unlike the real version. The emulated version's a little rough. But there's multiple fields scrolling by at the at different speeds, which is something that uh, is not the easiest thing for the Atari to be able to do. So it was kind of cool at the time. All right, there we go. See, normally you can just kind of spam the knife button and pick up a bunch of points for killing the alligators. The fast-moving ones like that will give you four points. Or 400 points. The kind of slower ones will do 100. You do have an air meter that you gotta deal with. That's true, I suppose they are technically crocodiles, not alligators, maybe. Meh, meh. I think they're cute looking. <laughs> Ah, dang it. You can actually jump over these as well. But it's a little bit harder. Ah, dang it. Ah! Alright, unfortunately this is not going so great. So I think I'm going to call Jungle Hunt here and move on to my next topic. Actually, let's see. As long as we got animals here, let's do Kangaroo. Uh, kangaroo is a fun one, too. This is uh, a post-Donkey Kong game, similar, of course, to Donkey Kong. Fun story. I saw... I have a distinct memory as a child of seeing a Kangaroo arcade cabinet 
in an IHOP. I remember we were on a family vacation once, and we went to an international house of pancakes, and there was a kangaroo arcade machine there. Oh no! I remember thinking at the time, I was like, wow, this is a lot like Donkey Kong. <laughs> Oh, dang it. All right, well, that's enough for that. But All right, let me move on to my third and final topic of the evening. Let me see the comments. <laughs> the Linted would be proud. Yep. You'll murder your F5 key. Yep. Eh, probably not. But It's possible they'll offer a peripheral to allow you to play your classic cards if it gets off the ground. Yeah, I would think so too. Uh, here's the other piece, actually, as long before I completely move off the VCS talk, is like the Ouya and like the Steam Box, the mod potential of this thing is fairly high. We all know Linux is pretty hackable, and a box like this with Linux is most likely going to get interest from the hacking community. So. What ultimately will the Atari box or the Atari VCS be able to do? Kind of hard to sell or to say, but um, but I, I for one think it could do some really cool things, and I would imagine, yeah, some kind of USB paddle, some kind of USB, you know, cart player or something like that. It could very well uh, be the case there as well. There is one other piece I guess I should mention. It was called the Atari box. Not the greatest name, not the worst name. They renamed it the Atari VCS. And that has some members of the classic game community all flummoxed as well. Why? Because the 2600 is technically called the Atari Video Computer System. So similar to the Xbox coming out with the Xbox 360 and then coming out with the Xbox One, well, what did you call the first Xbox? That was called the Xbox One. But now it's not the Xbox One, because the Xbox One is the third one. And so the original Xbox, I guess, is now the original Xbox. Kind of the same thing happening with the VCS. If you say, yeah, I got a six-switch VCS, or I got an Atari VCS, does that mean you got the new one, eventually? Or does that mean you have the original one? And it, does that just mean we're totally doing away with the VCS name in place of 2600? I guess. I don't know. It's causing some nomenclature and wiki confusion for those who are into that kind of thing. But it isn't. It isn't just Atari coming out with modern game consoles. For in recent years, last five to ten years, At Games, which is a popular peripheral maker of kind of classic portable units, licensing, and things like that, has come up with the Atari Flashback. They're at number eight on their iteration of the Atari Flashback. And what the Atari Flashback is, is sort of an original Atari-styled HDMI built-in game system with a selection of generally up to around 100, 120 classic Atari games that you plug in through HDMI into your television set and play old-school Atari. It's really not so much for the hardcore Atari collector as it is more for the nostalgia person. Um, they make nice little Christmas gifts. They're fairly inexpensive. Even their most expensive one, which is like the Atari uh, Flashback 8 Gold Edition that comes with a bunch of Activision games and that, even that's only 80 bucks. So typically they could run for about 50 to $70 and come packed with like 80 to 100 Atari games. And they're a really fun way for, let's just say, your your mom, your grandma, you know, people who grew up with Atari or what have you, your dad, what have you, who were just like, yeah, I used to play Atari, and I think they're pretty cool to get them a nice little fun Christmas present that they can spend a few weeks on and play. One nice thing about the original flashbacks as well, the joysticks are compatible with the original 2600. So if you're struggling to find an Atari joystick that still works nowadays flashbacks got it now the flashback unlike this portable one here which i'll get to in a second rather than the original atari switches it has like these bright orange buttons so it looks a little cheap 
and plasticky. It plays a little cheap and plasticky. It's basically a real low-powered uh, chipset that runs Stella, which is the thing I was just playing these Atari games on. But it's not terrible. And uh, it's a pretty fun little gift for those Atari fans in your life. They come out with a new one just about every year. That's why they've had the flashback, the flashback 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and now 8. They do some minor hardware iterations on each one. They learn from their mistakes the year prior. They've been able to re to license new games as they've been commercially successful, so the later versions tend to have more games on them than the earlier versions. The emulation gets a little better with each flashback. You know, some games are not emulated perfectly, and they're getting better and better at that. And they're probably going to come out, they probably will announce it around E3 here in June, they're probably going to come out with the flashback 9. The one thing about the flashback, uh, the classic Atari flashback, is it does not take an SD card. So whatever games are on it, that's it. You can only play the games on the flashback that come with the flashback. Rumor has it that the flashback 9 may finally add an SD card or some other kind of functionality to allow you to put games on. If that's the case, that could be really, really hot. Now, why wouldn't they just do that from the start? Well, because they kind of want people to buy a new one every year. And if you can get every Atari game on it, why would you be buying one of these every year? But they came out in 2016 with the Atari Flashback Portable. It is the first time that there has been a dedicated Atari 2600 VCS portable player. The very first time. You would think up to this point Atari might have gotten into the game. They did release the Lynx back in the day, but it didn't play 2600 games. There have been, you know, some portable compilations like on the PSP and things like that. So it's not like it was impossible to play these Atari games, but a dedicated unit just for Atari games came out in 2016 by At Games, the makers of the Atari Flashback. This is the 2016 version. There is a 2017 version as well that is very similar hardware-wise, but software-wise has another 10-ish games on it. They were able to license another 10 games for the 2017 version. I found this. I tend to search eBay for what uh, what's ending soon. $5. I got this on eBay for $5. They retail for about... When they first come out, they're about 50, and then within about six months, they go down to about 40. You can get it on a deal right now for about 37 to 45 dollars, depending on, you know, what's what's on sale and what hasn't. But this has 60 built-in games to it, including a bunch of classic games like Asteroids and Centipede and Frogger. Uh, it's got some of the old Sears telegames on there. It's got Combat, and on the back here, you know, it's got the full list of games on there, like Yar's Revenge, which is really cool. and It's got a few of the paddle games, which don't work great on this thing, but it has them nonetheless. You open up the box, and it's really pretty, pretty straightforward. There's the unit, the a USB cable, which you use to charge, and then an instruction book, a real kind of cheap little instruction book that just explains some of the basics of how to use it. So the unit itself here uh, is pretty portable, it's very light, it's a little on the cheap side, but it is a budget-type portable, so that can be excused. It has six buttons on it, and I saw someone on Facebook say, like, why is the Atari have six buttons? Well, because it emulates the switches. So you've got, this is the main Atari button from your joystick, and then you've got the a pause button, you have a left difficulty switch, a right difficulty switch. Um, the game select version, right there. Uh, you have the start button, the start and switch, and then the an extra button to get back to the main menu. And then just a basic D-pad on this thing as well. And so it's kind of cool. You just uh, fire it up. It has a nice long battery life. I actually have, I charged it when I first got this thing. And I've probably put in at least 10 hours into it, and it's still running fine. So I don't think this thing's much of a battery hog at all. For volume here, it just has a real 
kind of standard knob that you move up and down. So not digital or anything like that. Like I say, this is a budget unit, and it it has its budget pieces to it. But it also has some really nice pieces to it as well. It's got a, a hookup for like um, earphones, earbuds, and a set of built-in speakers, which are frankly kind of cheap. Like the, the raw sound of this thing is not great, but for whatever, you know, for, for what it is, it's perfectly fine. And as you can see, it actually plays the Atari games. You can't see it great because I'm trying to show this on a webcam here. But you can actually see it looks really, it emulates really nice. It's got a nice looking screen. And you can play all the difficulty stuff on it. And the D-pad, while not fantastic, isn't exactly terrible either. You know, it's got the nice sounds that come through. I don't know if you can hear it. And then overall, it is a really neat little portable Atari unit. I've actually really enjoyed this thing. And I uh, would easily recommend it to anybody who's looking for um, kind of a, a quick present for the Atari person in your life. But here's the trick. There are two things in particular that make this exceptionally cool and much more recommendable than the Atari Flashback itself. They're priced about the same. Flashback is fine. I don't own one, but I've seen them. And they're pretty awesome. But there's two things in particular about this that is super awesome. The first is this right here. That is not a headphone jack. That is an AV out jack. So you can take like a regular stereo cable, not a three-prong RCA cable, but a regular stereo cable, left and right stereo, plug it into here, and then one the right, the red, will be your video. The white will be your audio. It's mono. Atari games are mono. So depending on what you're set up and what you're hooking it to, you might need an adapter to take the mono into a traditional stereo, or you can just go into a mono speaker, or you can just have it go through one side of your stereo, whatever you want to do. But you can hook this up very quickly and easily to a television, a computer monitor, a stream box, um, a hotel television, a VCR, you know, anything that can take a video input signal through RCA jacks, you can hook up and play these games on the full screen in their regular resolution. You know, the Atari didn't have a big resolution. I think it was 240 by something. And so this is a portable Atari, not just for being a portable, but because you can take all these games, hook it up to your television, and just play Atari on your television. Now, you don't have the classic Atari joystick. You do have this D-pad. But like I say, the D-pad's functional and all that. Okay, so that's, that's the big one. But here is the one that is even huger, and I'm going to turn this off so I can show it to you. It takes an SD card. It runs Stella. So what that means is if you take an SD card and then you put these bin files onto it, you load it up onto this SD card and pop it in, turn on the unit, and then navigate over. Let me show you here. To page 7, SD card browser. So, I start up my browser here. It takes about a second or so to load. And then I have the entire list. I don't know if you can see it here. Yep, there we go. The entire list of every Atari game released for the VCS. You have to scroll through it, which is a lot of more work, and it's all alphabetical. But just about... Let's say about two-thirds of the Atari games play just fine on it. A few don't play just because of emulation issues, 